Okay, let's get started. Um, so today is sort of the, the presentations. Uh, so Dylan already went last time, and um, these are much briefer, so it's about 20 minutes plus five minutes for questions. And the first speaker today is Akinwande Atanda. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> so I met him uh, when I gave this uh, Canterbury Tech Talk, and he told me that he was not allowed to enroll in this class, so I said, why not? And so he's really picked up a lot of steam, so he's been analyzing Twitter data we've been collecting for what, 10 um, days now? Yeah, close to 10 days, yeah, yeah. two weeks. Yeah. So the second speaker is gonna be Enon Delev. That's Enon, he's from the School of Biological Sciences. He's a PhD student who's got maybe terabytes now of video data from spider eyes. So he's gonna mostly go through the science of, uh, of, um, of vision, spider vision. Um, and then we have uh, Shin Zhao, you all know the famous Shin. Shin is doing her project from the community edition, which is excellent, because that's the idea. So you guys sort of migrate to the community edition and live your own lives. And um, Shin will do it from there. And then Shanshan, Shanshan Zhu, yeah, she's uh, another PhD student in HitLab. She'll be sort of uh, showing some of her data from uh, electroencephalographs from the psychology department, EEG data. Um, yeah, human computer interface. Yeah, so yeah, so you should, should tell you about it. And then hopefully we'll get to Matt today. Matt is uh, taking the course and paying the money. So he's gonna be talking about tennis, um, analysis of tennis data. Okay. Good. Oh, hey, Ron. You um, know how to get to your place? To the right side. This will be so. so. Okay, good. Hi everyone, my name is Atruan and just like how I said, I'm from the Department of Economics and Finance. I'm a PhD student. Uh, this is my second year. So what I want to explain today is uh, what you've done in week six, but a little bit more kind of advanced and with some little bit of adjustment. So in week six, Raz actually introduced about a generic tweet collector, which you can collect streams of tweets from Twitter using the uh, Spark streaming API. So, and that is what I have here. So, and also what another thing I now talked about is, uh, what I want to talk about is, how can you track some certain keywords or probably hashtags? Maybe you want to track tweets actually relating to someone like Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton, or maybe you want to try some certain hashtag or you want to track over time. So instead of using that same code, you can just modify your code by adding a list of keywords. And the list of keywords, which actually I use in my own research, is I decided to focus on Donald Trump. So because that was what I've been working on for the past few months now. So using that, you, all what you just need to do is just to put it into, oh uh, yeah, yeah it is. So you can create a kind of a list of words, like call it track. So the least, you can put it as a string, something like Donald Trump 2016, make America great again, Donald Trump, and also you can have an hashtag created by Hillary Clinton followers, which is Love Trump's 8. And if you're not too sure about the popular tags to use, you can actually go to websites, which is uh, rightstag.com. So you can actually search your keywords and it's gonna give you list of popular hashtags as related to your keywords. So that will also help you to get enough tweets for your analysis. And people have actually used Twitter for so many things, for business, for marketing. But if you really wanna know much about it, you can actually go to, the web, to this website. You'll be able to know some of the other areas where you can apply Twitter streaming to, so yeah. So that's the first modification I made to the code. And another modification also I made to the code, the existing code is, what about, you don't really need all the information being supplied by Twitter because there are a lot of tons of information, like uh, the user details, like uh, the geographical coordinate and so many other bunch of information. But if you're so concerned about just the text, the favorite count, or probably you're concerned about the screen name, of the person that tweeted, you can also do some kind of flip trim. So all what you need to do is that uh, you need two things. The first thing is you need to create a class, 
create the class of kids and the expected values, whether it's a strings or integer. And that is what I have here. I won't really go much into details. So you can name your class as filter status. And that's why I have the screen name, which is a string, the username as a string, and all the rest. Then what you need to do is to create a function to convert all those streams coming from Twitter to the specified information you really need. And those information can actually be inputted as a function. You can divide it as a function, convert to filter, and you can also just go through it. And when you do that, instead of you converting your tweets to JSON format, there's no need to do that. All what you just need to do is just to pass it in through the RDD outputs, and it's just going to do the remaining work for you. So now we've collected like probably over 26.3 million tweets within the 10 days, within the last 10 days, which is really huge. But how, do we, how can we make best use of all these tweets we've collected so far? So how can we extract, how can we transfer, how can we load all these tweets? We already have a directory where we saved our tweets. We call it uh, Twitter new, but I just decided to use filter new because I did some more adjustment. So what you, what you need to do is just to go to your DB users and search for all the, all the tweets because all the tweets are coming in in form of in form of in terms of in streams or probably in stream of five minutes or in stream of 15 minutes. We decided to use the streams of five minutes or 10 minutes. Is it five minutes, Ross? Five minutes. Five minutes, yeah. So we are collecting a bunch of tweets in batches of five minutes. And now we have thousands of tweets RDD that have actually we have we've saved into our directory. So if you decide to load just one of the streams of tweets you've collected, you can use SQL context and read it as a JSON format. Then you can actually show it and see how it is. And these are all the information we've collected so far in a single batch of stream, which is contributors ID, created apps, and all the rest of the information. So you can have, you can easily view probably the first 20 tweets because you can view it all. And also you can likewise print the schema too, just for you to know uh, which one actually belongs to what and to know the association between all these information, how they are related. Because user as his own is a kind of a dictionary of all other information. So, and at the same time, you can decide to select some key information which you're interested in. Supposing you're interested in text, uh, you, from your data frame, just say selects text. If you're interested in the users, instead of using text, just put users there and and just put show. So you, you'll be able to view like the first 20 text or the first 20 information being required. And likewise, you can do more than that. You can select created at which is the day the tweet was created, the text, the favorite counts, the number of likes, and how many times has that particular tweet been retweeted. So you can also have a kind of overview. This is just to explore. And you can do so many other operations with it. You can add to the tweet count. You can do so many things. But the main thing is, now that we've collected all the tweets and batches, the next task is to match all the tweets together. So if you want to match, you can also use the same SQL context to actually read it as a JSON format. But instead of specifying individual batches of tweets, you can just use asterisk. That means it's going to gather all the batches of all the tweets in that same directory which you specify to save it. So when you load it, and one of the advantages that when you load all those your tweets as an SQL context, you can save it as a packet format, data packet format. And the reason why you need to save it in that format is that it's very easy for you to actually interact or retrieve data easily using your SQL, SQL syntax. So when you actually do the margin, after we did the margin, we decided to register it as a table and we're able to do some starting query like, okay, select all the information from the match text table. So you were able to get something like this. Since that our whole interest is just on the day the tweet was created and also the text that which we included in the match, in the match tweet streams. So we're able to retrieve these. I decided to limit it to one just to give it kind of an overview. And another thing is uh, you can also count the number of tweets you've collected so far. So just like today, we decide to, I decided to count the number of tweets we've collected so far for the past 10 days. And as at 3.30 PM today, we've collected like 26.3 million tweets, which is really huge. And you can also graph it. You can also give a kind of a plot chart to able to know how many tweets you collected every day or probably
probably every minute. So in this case, we decided to use same SQL syntax to determine the count of text. And also, we decided to retrieve the, the curated apps, which we actually plot under the x-axis. And this shows the first 1,000 observation for each minute or each day, I can remember. And also, you can also filter by query words. Since that all the tweets we've been collecting, we, didn't, we decided not to filter it. We're just collecting. We didn't restrict it to a part, particular keywords or particular hashtag or probably filter in terms of the required information we need. So if you have collected all these tweets also, you can also still do a kind of filtering by just retrieving the information you need, something like probably I'm only concerned about tweets related to Trump. So all what I need to do is just to reconstruct my query and just say, okay, retrieve all texts that actually have Trump in any body in, in any body of the text, whether in the beginning of the text, whether in the end of the text, whether in the middle of the text. Anywhere the keyword Trump appears is going to retrieve this. And from that, we have like 6,693 tweets related to Trump as of two weeks ago, as of probably five days ago. This is not a current one. And uh, you can also graph it at the same time, give a kind of a pretty representation of the number of tweets you've collected so far. And at the same time, you can retrieve it also to see the text of each tweet, like this one shows hashtag Trump, hashtag Trump, Dump Trump, same as Hillary, so all sort of hashtags, yeah. So with that, you can then decide to save your filtered tweets. Now I've decided to filter it to just Trump alone. I'm also concerned about all of that tweet that is not related to Trump. I'm only concerned about the one related to Trump. So with that, you can filter it, save it in the same data format, register it as a table, go through the same process of extracting, transforming, and loading again all over and all over again. And you can decide to do count, you're still gonna get the number of texts. And you can decide to also print it for each line. Is that you take three, but don't use collect, otherwise it's gonna take probably like five days before you get everything. So don't try. So but the major interesting thing is that you've collected all these tweets and what we're interested in is we want to know we want to do a kind of a sentiment analysis, be able to know some certain uh, opinion of people about some certain tweet, whether the tweet is negative about Trump, whether it's positive about Trump, whether it's positive about Hillary Clinton. But you know, when tweets comes in, it's very difficult for you to go through each tweet and label it as positive or negative. So all what you need to do is that there are some set of keywords, set of reviews, just like Amazon movie reviews, Amazon book reviews, like uh, NLTK couples movie reviews, those who are very familiar with NLTK module in Python. So you can use all those futurized reviews to train your tweets to identify whether it's positive or negative. But for the purpose of this presentation, what I decided to do is just to use the vector of positive and negative words used by Neil in one of his presentation. Yeah. So what I did is I, the, doc, the vector of the tweets are in text format. I decided to convert it to CSV format, which is a comma separated value format, and decide to maintain the label of is zero being negative and one being positive, and decide to load it inside, inside a cluster table. I decided to put in the table then, and this gives an overview of how the table looks like and the schema, and uh, you can now decide to exploit it. So in R, you can decide to do some certain exploration to know, okay, how many of the keywords are positive, how many of the keywords are negative. And we have, using this SQL syntax, you can decide to get those who are positive and those who are negative. It shows that we have close to 4,000 keywords being negative and over close to, like over 2,000 being positive, which is still good. And you can decide to convert all these things to data frame, all these tables into the data frame in R. So using this particular syntax and yeah. Another thing you might want to do is that if you, you can also decide to search from certain keywords, whether a particular keyword actually exists in your, in its set of keywords you have. And we can decide to try with amazing. Using this syntax, we can decide to query that, okay, does the data frame, the data frame, which is the class words, does it contains this particular word or text, amazing. 
And what we get is true, and from that we have, it's, it's our PS3 times. So that means the word amazing appears three times under the positive category of words we have, which is good, and appears none in the negative side. So that means the featureized text we want to use, it's kind of a little bit good, but not so good, which I'm gonna to explain to you later. Then what we now want to do is that we want to use these particular featured words. We want to take it to our machine learning pipeline, create a pipeline. And why we need to create a pipeline is that we want to let it learn from it so that it can be able to use it for prediction if we have some certain tweets and it can classify whether being positive opinion or negative opinion. Now that I have like over close to, uh, I have something like over 5,000 keywords, featureized text categorized into positive and negative, I decide to split it into the training set and the testing data sets. And uh, since they're, they're in one and zero, so that means a kind of like binary classification estimator, so I can use like logistic regression. And I can decide to fit in into the model that predicts with my transform model, which I'm gonna show you how I did it. So now you can decide to import all these models in Python. At the same time, you can implement the same thing in Scala, but I just decided to use Python because I'm much used to Python, I understand it better for the purpose of this class. So. Now you can decide to set all this parameter, your bin, which is your binarizer. So the category we have under the second column of our imported data set, we have the category which represents whether it's positive or negative. And so you can decide to name the output as label and decide to give a threshold of 0 0.5. That means any category that is more than 0 0.5 represents positive review. If I decide to put one to it, since I didn't have any, any integer greater than one, so it might not be able to recognize the threshold. And also, tokenize, and also tokenizer, what tokenizer does is that if we have a bunch of sentences, it can split it into words. That's the essence of the talk. Because I have the words column, so my input is words and also decided to give me an output of what talks. So, and also hashing to, it can also do a kind of like, you can also hash some of these tokenizers too to get your features test and limit it to probably like 5,000 keywords or probably 4,000 keywords. But because we actually don't have more than like around 5,000 plots, so I decided to limit to 5,000. And you can set the parameter for your logistic regression model. And you can play around with the elastic net parameter by reading the Spark ML uh, documentation. Then the next thing you need to do is to create your pipeline and you can create it in stages and just like how it just showed here. And uh, in R, I need to import my table into my R notebook as a data frame. So which I did and I decided to split my data frame. That means 70% of the data frame is split into training data mm -hmm. and 30% is split into test data. So the first thing I need to do is I pick one of these data sets since I have two data sets to train it first and also to evaluate the model whether it's good or not before I start feeding it with my tweets to predict the not. So what I did is the first one, I created a model which is also dependent on the pipeline. So it feeds it with the training data sets. So feeding it with the training data sets is gonna generate, it's gonna train it over time. Sometimes it might take five minutes or something less than that. It depends on the size of the keywords we actually fit into it. Then the next thing is, since I already have a model, now I now want to predict it. Try to, I want to assess the performance of my model, whether it is good and or not. But because my, my test data set already has a label, I can easily compare whether it's predicting well or not. So what I need to do is I take this model and decide to transform it using my test data, since I've already split it into two. And with the prediction, I can decide to display it and see how the prediction is. These are my keywords, which is the tokenized keywords. And these are my original labels, and these are the predictions. The first one, it got the first one abandoned. It got it, very, it, got it right. The prediction is zero. And the real label is also zero. And now, the probability being shown here is the probability of whether that particular keyword is zero or one. So you have this one very close to one, which shows that the prediction is zero. Now, there's a difference between the label and also the prediction. 
And if you look at the probability of that particular prediction being zero, it's, it's, it's far away from one or even far away from 0 0.5. And the highest is being one, and that is why you have it as one. And you can also sh decide to show just the probability of being a zero alone using this particular syntax. And now, I now want to evaluate the model. How can you evaluate your model? You can import what they call multi-class classification evaluator, feeds in with your prediction, your label, which is the original one you have. And also you have the prediction model, which I have here, which is what I fit in, which I've actually transformed my original model into using my test data. And with that, I have a logistic regression accuracy rate of 0 0.64. And the accuracy rate plus the error rate is equal to one. So the higher the accuracy rate is equal to one, the better is the model. Now, which is like, now we have something like 0 0.64, which is something not so good. But because the way I splitted my old data set into the training, and also the test data set is true random. So that means it's gonna be splitting 70% of it for the training, for the testing data set is gonna be random. So you can decide to productionalize the whole thing and create a kind of a, a scheduled job by doing a kind of a continuous training. And you can decide to set up an alert when the training starts, when it ends for each of the successful ones. So just by going to jobs, if you go to jobs, you can easily do all those or do all your setups. and just import, just upload your, your notebook. And in my home case, I'm using a binary classification tool. So I decided to upload it into my jobs and decide to start a job. And for the first job, I have the first, I decided to present the first two jobs here. For the first jobs, this is how the predictions looks like. There are still, there are still a little bit of disjoint between the label and the prediction. That means it's not getting it right in some cases as expected. And for the second run too, you can see that set of the words I have is quite different from here. It's because of the random split of the whole data set. And the accuracy rate for the first run is quite different from the second run. So the more you train the data sets, the more the accuracy rate improves over time. So you can leave it for like, probably you can do like around 10 runs. You can leave it for like a day or two days. Some people do it for like a month. It all depends on you. So, but the main thing is, the next thing which we plan to do is to have more reviews, probably from Amazon, from movie reviews from Copals, which is a NL NLTK based, and use all these training features to train the model better so that we can actually feed in our tweets to give a better prediction whether being positive or negative. Thank you very much. If you have any questions. So how, how how long did you take to learn all this? Because you missed the first six weeks of the class or something. Oh, yeah. Uh, because I've been, doing, I've been doing my tweet collection on Python before, so it doesn't really take me much time. And also, and this is my first time of actually using Scala, but, uh, which I really have to read wide and you know, have some sleepless nights. So, yeah. so that's it. Yeah. So are there any questions for us? Uh, so we the commercial. Yeah, the commercial, yeah, good, fantastic. Yeah, that's a very good thing. Uh, you now, a lot of people are actually using tweets for so many things, and I can give you a very good example. Uh, there's a project which I'm actually doing with somebody else. It's about a retail marketing business here in New Zealand, but it's still ongoing. And we decide, we find out that, as in people are really so dissatisfied with a particular merchant, so we feel like if we can actually stream tweets about people's complaints, we can easily come up with something to actually modify their business or probably come up with a very good product which you can actually sell to them. So something like that. So, and from there you can easily figure out some major keywords that people complain about often. So probably people are complaining about the customer services or probably delays in delivery and things like that. You can easily leverage on that to actually come up with something. You just have to be innovative around it. Yeah. So you collect in the tweets from every tweet coming to Twitter? Or? Uh, yeah, it depends. You can decide to filter the tweets and you can decide not to filter it. And I can give you a very good example. You can decide to limit your tweet to a particular uh, geographical coordinate 
probably let's say just tweet from New Zealand alone, you can do that. And you can also limit it to probably you want to tweet about, you want to drop tweets from University of Canterbury, you can do that. You can do that in two stages by limiting it to, uh, to New Zealand geographical region alone, and also at the same time, use some certain keywords that are very common to University of Canterbury. You can do that. And you can do that for any company, any products, you know, for any, yeah, for so many things. If you collect everything, then you can apply the Yeah, and it's very, even if you also, if you have the data storage capacity, you can collect as many as possible. Because you can also use that same thing for something like graphics analysis or something like that. Yeah, so it's all the things. So is there any other question for I have one one suggestion, right? So, okay. so you haven't done, uh, you know, some sort of uh, improvement by scanning through hyperparameters, right? You fixed it that you're doing the elastic net. Yep. It froze the fix the hyperparameter. Yep. So usually, you know, there was a part where we did where we can actually do a bit search and train that. That may improve this number. Also. Yeah, does it? Yeah, because I also tried with some. Well, what I tried, I decided to change the elastic net parameter, and I got. A, even a better correlation rate at 0 0.6. And you can also create a kind of a loop to also to change its problem within. You can start from a 0 0.3 or 0 0.4 and increase the weight's interval of 0 0.1 at all the time. So you can do that. Yeah, so this, yeah. this whole pipeline, I think this one is part of the pipeline where you can do the hyperparameter search. Yeah, you can do that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So I think uh, let's, uh, let's do another one. So the next speaker is um, Enon. Um, no, I forget your name. <laughs> I can only click and then say the name. <laughs> so is this it? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. So as Monty Python said, now for something completely different. Uh, I'm Enon, and I study spiders. And that's my first confession. And my keen interest is in deciphering spider vision. And in order to explain that to you, I will begin, is the mouse upside down? I will begin first to talk a little bit about spiders. After that, explain a little bit about vision and spider vision in particular. And finally, about my actual work, how I decipher uh, the visual capabilities of spiders. Now, to begin with that, Let's talk about spiders. I use jumping spiders, which are the common house hoppers that you see running along your walls and you see them sometimes on the ground, etc. They're about yay big, about a centimeter, usually half a centimeter large. And if you ever get the feeling that they're watching you, they are. They're incredibly curious animals and highly visual, as you can see in this video here. This is a spider following a laser pointer. It looks like a cat, and a lot of their behaviors are actually feline in nature. They're very active hunters. They like to play around with some things, uh, and they're, of course, very photogenic, as you can see here. Now, there are about 5,000 described species of jumping spiders alone. To put that in context, that's about the same number of mammals on the planet in the spiders. Just uh, please move this window away from the, I don't know what that means. I don't know. Um, the screen sharing is paused for Zoom share maybe. Sorry about this. No worries. Um, this one? No, well, yeah. This one. Hmm. Oh, well, sorry. So it doesn't share the PowerPoint. It says, please move this window away from the shared application this window being the PowerPoint. Okay. okay. Oh well. Right, so we said about 5,000 described species of jumping spiders and roughly the same amount of mammals on the planet. All spiders, including jumping spiders, have eight legs and eight eyes. They're about five to 10 uh, millimeters in length. Dineural, meaning that they're active in the day, which of course makes sense for a visual animal and incredible hunting behaviors. Now, I won't go into detail, but aspects of smoke screening their movement, deceit, uh, even um, 
uh, what's called uh, cheating. So in other words, they walk onto uh, another spider's web and pretend to be a fly struggling and then hunt the spider as it's coming to attack them. Those are the sort of behaviors that they do. Incredibly, they can also do a detour that takes about two hours to come upon their prey from a direction that they won't see them. As visual hunters, what we want to look at is their eyes. And as I said, jumping spiders have eight eyes, and from this SEM uh, microscopy, you can easily tell that there are different kinds of eyes. Jumping spiders have very two large eyes in the front, which makes them very animated. Uh, and those eyes are different from all the other smaller eyes which surround the head. The two large ones are called primary eyes and the smaller ones secondary eyes, and together they give a field of view roughly encompassing the animal. Now to understand the differences between them, we need to look inside the head. What we can see here is that the secondary eyes are small in structure and have what's called a static retina. It's a very small, single layer retina. The retina is where the photoreceptors reside. It's kind of like a sheet behind the lens. Now, I don't know how much you guys know about arthropods, uh, which is the family which includes spiders, but all of them have their skeleton on the outside. And the lens is part of that skeleton. In other words, their lens doesn't move. If you want your eyes to point at something, you need to turn your entire body for the eyes to point at there. That's where the primary eyes come in. What we can see in the primary eyes is this interesting tube. And this tube has a number of muscles around it. And there's another lens at the very end of this tube. This tube is called the eye tube. And those muscles that surround it enable some degrees of motion. And more interestingly, the retina that sits at the end of this tube, which has the shape of a boomerang, has a number of layers. And each one of those layers has a different job and different resolution, different capabilities. So as I said, roughly encompasses their entire field of view. The spider can see behind it in every which direction. Now, when something moves, the spider will quickly turn, so its two primary eyes will point at that thing. The reason is their primary eyes act much like our fovea acts. So the highest resolution possible where we see details is in the fovea for us or for the spider, it's in the primary eyes. And as I said, the retina of the primary eyes has the shape of a boomerang. And both of those together look kind of like a chromosome. I don't know if those are analogies that make any sense to you guys. Now, in, as, I, as I hinted to earlier, they do show some degree of movement, which is important because the field of view of the primary eyes is very small, as you can see. So we have this entire field of view, which the secondary eyes can see, but he sees in detail only along the lines of this boomerang. And the motion gives him a little benefit there. Now, the way this acts is, this is how they analyze the world that they're looking at. The secondary eyes don't have high resolution. The primary eyes do. So when he sees something interesting, he will turn his primary eyes to it and then start scanning it. The person who discovered these motions is Mike Land, and he did this work in 1969. And here we see a diagram that he took of the spider's head. So you can see the secondary eyes with their single layered retina, here in the front and here in the back, and the primary eyes of the long eye tube and this tiny little boomerang-shaped retina at the end, and the muscles that surround it. And what he showed was that there are four distinct types of motion that these retinas do, that the primary eyes make. The first is spontaneous activity, so basically when there's nothing to see, from time to time they kind of move about. Saccadic motion, a saccade is a very quick jerk of the eye to bring it to focus on another point. So when something comes into the field of view, the eyes snap to attention to that object. Tracking, so if that object is moving in the world, the retina will follow that object as it goes along. And finally, scanning, which is a to and fro motion, as he described it in 1969, probably to build uh, the picture of what it is that we are seeing. So just going over the entire object with his retina to accumulate details of that image. Now, importantly, this little black box here was all that Mike Land was able to see in his special microscope. That special microscope is called an ophthalmoscope. Now, an ophthalmoscope is basically a medical device that we use today in order to point it to our retinas and for doctors to check that your eyesight is well and that your retina is healthy. 
An ophthalmoscope for a spider is much the same thing. So here we can see a little spider tethered on a small polystyrene ball in front of an ophthalmoscope, and lo and behold, we can see the retinas. This star here is the highest resolution, and this over here is a retina of one of the secondary eyes. So you can see they're vastly different. This is the same micros uh, uh, image enhancement, the same uh, level of microscopy, and the retinas of the primary eyes, you can see the boomerang, and the secondary eyes, you can see the individual photoreceptors. Those are these black dots in the retina. Now, because spiders are much smaller and the optics is very different, an ophthalmoscope for them is also slightly different. This is my setup here. Here we have a small spider tethered with wax. This is because when you ask the spider to sit still in front of the lens, he won't do so. So we tether them in front and put them in front of a screen, which is about 50 times their size. A lens, sorry, a lens that is about 50 times their size. And in order to see into their eyes, this entire setup has a lot of lenses and beam splitters in order to narrow a beam into their eyes and get the resolution that we want. Now, what we wanted with this ophthalmoscope is to be able to see the entire retina and not just that center black area. So we can actually see the entire scanning motion and start analyzing how they look at the world. So to explain how it works, more or less, this is the first part. We have a camera and that gives us pictures from inside the spider's eyes. There is a beam splitter here because we need to add a light source in order to illuminate the retina, otherwise we won't see anything. So another tube here through a number of lenses and filters, including an infrared filter. This is to make sure that when we point the point of light into the spider's eye, he won't be blinded and spiders don't have the ability to see into the infrared. Finally, because this is science and not a medical degree, uh, we need a stimulus. So for a stimulus, we have another beam splitter and we put a projector. And that's where I project stimulus into the spider's eyes and see how they look at them. This is the tools that I had. And now into how I actually look at the data. Initially, what do I actually want to do? So back in the 80s and 90s, we started realizing that humans analyze images. And this is the kind of work that they do. You show a person a face and we see which points of the face they look at. And then a few years later, we did the same thing with chimpanzees. I want to do the same thing with spiders. Of course, a human face or a mammalian face for that matter means little less to a spider. So I use different kinds of stimuli. Initially, very simple things, just a bar, a square, circle, and two circles. And then these two, which are, well, can you guess what they are? They're spider faces. Now, we know these are spider faces because when we show them these images, they start courtship behavior or hunting behavior, depending how uh, the behavior of that specific spider is. So they see this image as the eyes of a spider, and that's a very strong cue for their behavior. And this one as a jumping spider because it has the front legs as well. So these are the sort of cues that they pick up on and categorize as something specific. I used four different species. For each species, I recorded about 580 video. Uh, that's a roughly 100 hours of video that I needed to analyze. The camera that I used was crap, but it needed to be very good in the infrared. So that means it only recorded raw format. And I ended up with roughly two terabytes of raw video to go through frame by frame to analyze how they look at the pictures. And one of the things that I realized after pre-processing the images was there were vastly different image qualities that the microscope collected. Here, you can just barely see the retina here. Over here, it's completely hidden. There's one here and the other one here. This one turned out great, and this one just was completely noisy. Now, when I recorded them, I didn't see this. This is how the original recording looks. Can you see the retina's moving there? Very hard to see it. And after pre-processing, I could see the quality that it was there. So here, if we move through it again, you see this light shade moving back and forth. That's my data, but that is completely unusable. I needed to transform this data into something that I could use. And that means that I needed to start tracking the retinas. So after pre-processing all those videos, I had basically terabytes upon terabytes of JPEGs. And I went frame by frame to recognize where in the picture the retina is currently. Now, to make things easier, I was only looking at the fovea, the very center of the retina. And that's that area over here where the, well, the split of the boomerang. Two ways to do this. 
manually. Go frame by frame and click where the center of the retina is. And my finger today is a lot stronger. Thank you. Another way to do this is using machine learning. And this is basically a classification task. The code that I used was first create a database of positive and negative data sets. So what is a retina and what isn't a retina. After that, I computed the HOG, that's the histogram of uh, gradients, which is basically taking a picture and saying, hey, how does this picture split in terms of pixels? That is a data set that I can classify later on. Using that data set, I trained a classifier using an SVM machine learning task using MATLAB in this instance. And then I ran image detection on each frame, one after another. Now to do, run that on each frame, basically what I do, I have a sliding window, the size of the retinas that I had in the training set. And that window th went through all the pictures of each JPEG and said, is this a retina or isn't this a retina until it found a retina and then it marked it. Now, sometimes this worked and sometimes it didn't. And that's because the devil is in the details, especially in machine learning. Creating the right data set and defining the size of that window are key aspects. And if two images before we saw vastly different uh, qualities, this entire area, for example, is a blind spot. And whenever the machine learning went through there or the retina moved through there, it lost the retina and then couldn't find it again. So about two thirds, I actually did by hand. Nonetheless, after all this, i managed to get a data set and through that data set, I managed to track the retinas. And here we can see videos of how the retina is moving overlaid upon a stimulus. And what we can see here is that different stimuli cause the spiders to follow through very differently. They obviously move along the edges, more or less. We can see here that he's moving along the leg and around the eyes and focusing on the smaller eyes. And then both of them at some point kind of look for what else is in the world. <laughs> and then come back to the stimulus. Right, so this is awesome. This is data that I can't do anything with because this is not statistics. This is just cool images. So I need to take all this information and turn it into actual XY coordinates, which was actually pretty easy to do. However, as you saw in the previous video, some of the stimulus were crooked. This was due to bad experimental design. And after a year of running these recordings, I couldn't afford to redo everything. That means I needed to normalize all my data back to a single image. Luckily, MATLAB is very good at doing this as well. You just give them the two images, it recognizes the various points that correlate to one another and translates the data. So basically, if the stimulus was crooked, just turn the stimulus, use that same matrix that you use in order to transform the image and do that on the stimuli itself. So all these points turned around. That means that I now have a data set of aggregated information from all the spiders for each species. And this is the kind of results that I can actually use for the papers that I'm writing. Now this first one, what we see here is a heat map. A heat map is kind of like a density map of how often the fovea of the spider's center of their attention is on that point. And this is actually pretty awesome. This is completely new. I just finished making these about a week ago. Uh, well, haven't finished quite yet. Well, we can see they focus mainly on the primary eyes. These are these two, two big circles on the secondary eyes and a little bit around the legs, not too much. And then there's this area here. Now I have two explanations for this area here. One of them, the eyes were at rest. So they just dropped to the bottom, but I filtered out all the points that followed through. I was only looking at information where between each frame, the retina was in a different location. So I'm only looking at movement in other words. So this doesn't look like an area where they just rest. However, if you consider the size of the retina, that size correlates to when, for example, the fovea is here. So the center of the retina is here. The edge of the retina is here on the leg. When the center of the retina is here, the edge of the retina is here at the edge of the circle. That means they're using the edge of the retina for edge detection. Edge detection is very strong when you move your retina to a different light. So if you take the edge of your retina and move it from a black, 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 white, that changes very strong signal to the brain. So by using the edge of the retina for edge detection, that's exactly what we have here. These two shapes, if you put them one on top of another, they're more or less the same. So that's what we see here. Other kinds of statistics that I'm now attempting to do, 
kernel density. So that's basically comparing the heat maps between different species, seeing how aggregated they are and whether or not they're statistically different from each other. Distance to stimuli. So I took all these stimuli and turned them into vectors and just did a K and N, a K nearest neighbors for each point of my data to where the stimulus is. And that can show me how often they follow the edges compared to how often they look in other areas. And finally, a clustering algorithm to see where the points aggregate, again, using machine learning. Now these, uh, the clustering, I've already done some, but because this is unpublished, then my advisor asked me not to show it quite yet. But that's my data. Any questions? What's the motivation? Oh, sorry. <laughs> What's the motivation? You mean besides the fact that this is completely <laughs> awesome? <laughs> I do have an answer for you, though. So, neurobiology is the same throughout the animal kingdom. By understanding how an animal with 500,000 neurons is capable of vision comparable to our own, we will learn a lot about how minimized networks can compute a lot of information. In context, a cockroach has a million neurons. We have 100 billion neurons. And a spider has 500 million. So it's a tiny brain with vision and behavior that should be much beyond its capabilities. So all neurobiology is the same. If we decipher how they do this and we're looking into their neurobiology as well, we will learn a lot about network computation in uh, a brain. Beyond that, you absolutely never know where science will go. The cochlear implant is the result of research that started into uh, cricket mating behavior, mating song of crickets. And that led to the cochlear implant. So you don't know where it will go. You do science for the sake of enjoying it. <laughs> Why spiders go other Mainly because, well, a lot of other animals are doing this, but the spider visual system is very vastly different. Uh, and you're looking for things that are different to learn something new. So the visual system is, uh, first of all, um, distributed. The eyes are separate. For, for us, it's one eye that sees both the periphery and the center of vision. For them, it is separate. Uh, they also compute information separ uh, separately and centrally. And their visual capabilities and vision-based behavior is higher than any other arthropod. Also, we like spiders, and you got funding for the Royal Society of Zealand. Yeah, that's that. That helps. <laughs> yeah. How long have you been doing the project? Uh, I'm just in the beginning of my uh, fifth year, so finished four years and well, just uh, got an extension to write my uh, PhD. So I've uh, four years so yeah. so far. It took a year and a half for this microscope to arrive. So the first year and a half, I didn't do much. Yeah. Uh, what machine learning helps you to? Um, predict the behavior of the spider eyes? Potentially, yes. Uh, one of my hopes is to use an algorithm, kind of like a Markov model, to base the next location of the retina uh, upon where it was earlier. And machine learning can definitely help with that, but again, the devil is in the details uh, to collect that data without the noise. And for that, I need a different kind of normalization from what I have. I normalize my data according to where the stimulus is. Uh, to predict the location of the retina, I need to normalize the data according to a baseline of the retina being in the same location for each spider and not upon where the stimulus is. Because following through the stimulus is one aspect, but a big part of predicting where the retina is is also knowing that there are physical limitations to where the retina can go. And the, as you saw, the spider is a lot smaller than microscope. There are going to be differences in the exact location of the spider for each point. So for some of them, they need to look a little up. For some, they need to look a little down. And that will change the predicting behavior. Well, right now. I was asking, do you think that they are following a specific patterns of how they can have evidence, like they will look at the same thing and they age, and they go back to the same thing and they yeah. go back to the age. So that would be like a form of machine learning to avoid it as a yeah, yeah, it could, so long as you keep it in one species, uh, in one spider individually also. And that means you need a large database for that one spider before you do something else, and spiders get bored. 
So after three minutes of this, they stop reacting to images altogether, for example, in each experiment. It definitely can be done, but I think we need better technology of recording first. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. How do you acquire spiders? Because I imagine they're quite hard to catch each other. Uh, they're actually pretty easy to catch. Uh, I use a number of different species. Uh, I use two local species, uh, which we saw in the image in the beginning. Uh, one of them I collect uh, from Birdling's Flat. They run around there on the stones. Uh, and I use the species from Kenya, which I had someone else collect for me, and a species from Australia, which there is a breeder there that send them over. Because of that, I work in a PC2 lab, and I need to go through a lot of security doors to get into the lab. How do you hold them? Uh, so a little dab of beeswax with a dental toothpick. So I dab the toothpick into this wax and then place it on the head of the spider. And I give the spider the small polystyrene ball so he doesn't feel like he's falling in the world. They hold on to this ball very easily. Like ants, they can carry more than 50 times their own weight. So they use this ball and they run around it. And as they run around in the world, the ball just turns in every which direction. By the way, there is a virtual reality system for spiders using this ball. So you paint the ball and you use a camera to follow through on the movement of the ball, and you see the spider navigating the world, because as he's running around, you change the images in front of him. And they readily react to such images. They behave towards screens much like we do. So it works very well. Okay, well, thanks, guys. Yeah, yeah, we did. <laughs> no spiders were harmed during this experiment. Yeah. Just oh, traumatized. Uh, well, the uh, uh, spiders that are not from New Zealand, we don't release afterwards. They live in the lab, live throughout their lives. All right, let's thank you now one more time. Thank you. So our next speaker is uh, Shin. And Shin has been using the community edition, which is great. So she's doing a presentation. Right. So uh, for the community data breaks edition, you only, unfortunately, you only have one core, which even not to one core is point AA something. So that's my uh, cluster here. I have uh, six gigabyte in my cluster. And uh, this, in this project, the motivation is how you develop uh, your own algorithm, own library to kind of uh, either do a commercial or research project. So. Actually, I'm really happy to hear the last uh, presentation because this is very much related. Also, we kind of extension the spectral clustering in a high order, uh, high order to reduce more noise, which help to uh, do the clustering or classification. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. So the library we create already been attached to uh, this cluster. Uh, since you are, the audience all come from the different uh, backgrounds, so I'll give you a little bit of uh, introduction of what is the spectral clustering. Uh, some of you may be very familiar with, some of you not. Uh, so this is one of the clustering approach, of course. Um, the uh, why I call spectral is because it's related to a spectral graph theory. So it's not working directly on the raw feature space. So whatever you collect is actually transform the data into a similarity matrix or some people call it affinity matrix. Um, the similar, what's the similarity metric? It basically, it just gave you some quantitative assessment of uh, uh, the similarity, similarity between a pair of data. So the pi feature can be a single feature or on a multivariate space. Um, so after that, what the spectral cluster did is to reduce the noise in the uh, similarity metric space, then do the uh, clustering of uh, algorithm afterwards. Um, as an extension, you can actually have a variety of similarity measurements. Uh, like one, you can use uh, simply use one minus Euclidean difference, or you can actually transform to a kernel space uh, using, for example, using Gaussian kernel. When you adjust the um, the Gaussian 
skill parameter which actually serving as a, a nearest neighbor. So you, back, you basically control how you want to count the weight on the nearest neighbors. So by that, uh, uh, by the Gaussian skill parameter, which serving which particular good for a uh, image cluster, uh, clustering because it's solving the convexity problem. Um, so this graph here basically uh, shows the steps when you're doing the uh, spectral clustering. So you starting in the raw feature space, you transform this to affinity matrix or similarity mirror. Um, then you kind of compute the dominant eigenvector and eigenvalue. Then you can truncate in the eigenspace, which kind of serving as a, a noise deduction. Then you can do the uh, combine with any clustering algorithm like a k-mean, like a, a near, like a, um, you can even do a support vector machine, and then you project the cluster labor back to the original uh, data. When you um, for the different purpose of clustering, you can choose different cluster always like uh, something like uh, the second row here. Actually, is after you. Uh, project it to the latent space, you choose the, uh, because you, you kind of having uh, asymmetric, uh, so you have a N by M matrix here, you have asymmetric, but there is some correlation there, so you can use a bi-clustering to clustering both simultaneously on the column direction and the row direction. Uh, so this is an example that image, if you um, use some spectral clustering combined with a different type of cluster algorithm, you will have some quite different uh, clustering result. Uh, the second one here, the first one is came in, the second one is using discretized, which that's the reason why you have a lot of block layer. Um, let's give a brief comparison. I didn't do it, it's I simply uh, link the that's the Python uh, the Python scheduling package right uh, give this plot uh, uh, so that's very simple like uh, the first row here is we actually obviously we have a two cluster here but some of the algorithm like a uh, uh, mean shift uh, affinity propagation doesn't really uh, give you a proper appropriate uh, separation of the two cluster. But uh, uh, it seems spectral clustering do well. Um, the second case is the same spectral clustering do well. But when you go to the third row, you can see the disadvantage of the uh, spectral clustering is the number of clusters has to fix. So it cannot learn the number of clusters. That's unfortunately so mistakenly um, clustered back two together. Now, um, why we want to do the motivation, why we want to expand the spectral clustering to a high order uh, spectral clustering is when we do the dimension reduction, when you do the um, similarity measurement on a matrix which is two order, um, you, cannot, you only reduce the noise from your similarity mirror, or say you, you can call it a kernel space, uh, which basically doing a, a special PCA, which is a kernel PCA. Um, however, it doesn't really mirror the correlations in between each of the raw feature space. And also cannot, if say you mistakenly introduce one of the um, feature which actually is relevant to your cluster doesn't really contribute anything to your clustering. However, you, you are not able to reduce that noise from the feature space. You can only reduce reducing the kernel space. That's the first motivation. Uh, the second reason is uh, when we, uh, that's actually my work related, when we do the uh, spectral embedding in the two orders dimension, we cannot explain which feature actually contribute more to my result. So when we do on a high order, we can, because we can uh, turning the result back to the raw feature space. Now, how we do the uh, high order spectral 
clustering is similar as previous procedure, but we have a uh, um, we when we have we start from the raw feature space, but however when we turn it to the similarity measurement, we turn it to a similarity tensor rather than matrix, and then we do the uh, eigen singular decomposition on the uh, similarity tensor, then we do the clustering also on the tensor space. Then we project the labor back to the uh, raw features, uh, raw data space. So what is tensor then? <clears throat> a tensor is just a, um, this is a particular uh, example of the tensor. Tensor can be any order. This graph here just gives you a three order tensor. So you have a three mode, uh, which means you looking at uh, which direction as your main direction. Uh, mode one is simply along this direction, mode two is horizontal and uh, mode three is that one. Um, so similar as when you do the um, similar decomposition as the to order, um, this one is to project your original tensor, means uh, decompose your original tensor into the, um, I should call it a mode one singular vector, mode two singular vector, and mode three singular, singular vector plus the code tensor. Uh, then, you can see here is when why I can do the uh, noise reduction is you can choose a dimension to keep for each set of the singular vector and your cotensor to reconstruct your original tensor, which will result in two tensor here. So one of the tensor is the tensor you're going to send to the cluster and another tensor actually is the noise you want to remove. So, um, for example, if I define the tensor as uh, this way, so my first, my mode, uh, my mode one and mode two, so along the mode one and the mode two, I represent one layer of my feature, then the third mode means how many features I have. So by truncate, the third dimension here, so that's the uh, C set of the singular vector, which actually reduces the noise in the feature space. But the, because uh, um, the, for the spectral clustering, the disadvantage of spectral clustering has two. Um, one is that one of that is the scalability because when you do the SVD decomposition, which is very expensive uh, in, t in terms of both performance and the memory wise, that's, some, that's the motivation why we choose Spark to do this, uh, to do this library. Um, the most difficult part is when we do the tensor embedding part. You can look at the, um, when you have a three mode of the tensor, when you do the unfolding, that's one of the uh, embedding steps. You have to do unfold the, uh, the tensor into a big matrix here. So each of the mode will have a different unfolding. Unfortunately, is when we define um, the data structure in Spark, you have to choose one of the mode as your RDD structure, which means if we define the RDD as mode one, when you do the second mode uh, unfolding or folding back, you need to do a lot of data shuffling, which is kind of very expensive. So design of the data structure in this computation is very, very important. Um, here, I just give you an example um, why memory-wise is so expensive. Is when you have a matrix which contain the double, uh, the size is 100k by 100k. It requires 80k gigabyte. So you can think about when when we do a uh, high order spectral clustering, we actually increase the dimension from nd to nnd, which is extremely larger than uh, the 
uh, previously. So it's not really, um, which means this method is not really suitable for a large number of classrooms. And, and also it's very, very difficult to do uh, out of sample embedding. What that means is if you have, want to have a training model and want to uh, forecasting for the coming data, this algorithm is really, really hard because the, it's working in the latent space. When, we, when you're working with um, metric space, you can use in uh, two order, which means um, you can use some approximation do the output of sample embedding, uh, but for the high order in the literature, not yet uh, such method exists. This is just, uh, um, I didn't, because um, the, the way I import uh, the main library is as a jar, so it doesn't really show the, all the source code. Here I just give you a little bit example of when I do the unfolding and the folding. You can see this is, uh, uh, the tensor is a RDD of uh, int, int and the vector uh, array of doubles. So when I do the uh, different dimension, there is a lot, a uh, different mode, there is a lot of uh, um, somewhat like, because I'm doing, uh, oh, because I'm doing the tensor in the mode one, when I define the RDD is on the mode one structure. So when I do the fold, actually the first dimension is most easiest one. But when I do the second mode, that will be need a lot of group by a lot of flat map, which is quite expensive. Um, now let me give you working, this is a just brief uh, introduction to the algorithm. Let me give you a case study to show, compare when you do on spectral clustering, what's the difference when you do on spectral clustering and the clustering on the original feature uh, space. Um, the data I use is to, oh, sorry, that's mis, mis here. Uh, the data I use is open source data from Wikipedia. You probably remember in RAS, uh, when RAS teach the MLLib machine learning package for K-mean clustering, actually one of the uh, figure here is token from, uh, the, is from the data set. Why I use this data set is really because this figure here. Um, when I look at this figure, I think oh, it must be something wrong. Because if you look at that figure, it doesn't make any sense. That's the true clustering. So in this data set, you have, uh, that's about the, uh, the some data about uh, uh, three, three species for this flower. Um, when, you, when, when you look at, uh, this, this, uh, this actually uh, is a watcher in the Wikipedia. You can find the uh, link in the Wikipedia. The Wikipedia side, lots of people using this data set for um, classification because it has the true label. So you can learn the original author is uh, uh, Fisher Ronald. He's using this, uh, doing some linear discriminatory um, studies. When, when, uh, when, when Mr. Fitt, uh, Fisher doing this study, he found that uh, this particular species is quite easy to be separate out. But the other two species here, you need additional information to separate, uh, to separate that out. That's the flower here. So the Cetosha is the one that is quite easy to separate out. But the other two species here is, uh, uh, Worsi color and the Virginica is quite hard to be separate out without additional information. So some people use this for classification study and uh, some people use it for clustering algorithm because when you have the true label, you can uh, kind of evaluating how your model perform. Um, but when you look at this plot, it doesn't really make any sense. First of all, if you look at the third, this is the uh, true 
the color represents the two spaces uh, class. The red one actually is e very easy to separate out. But in the K cluster, uh, K-mean clustering here, the result here doesn't make sense because it seems like uh, this clutter here is not easy to be separated from the green, but um, it can be, I don't know, it can be kind of like, a, because K-mean doesn't really have a, um, if you, if you don't really control, it depends how you, how you use your K-mean algorithm. If you choose a wrong initial or do not to guarantee it converge at least to the local, you might have some really bad result at this. But really, I don't think that's really represent how K-mean perform in this graph. So, um, I'll show you later on when I redo, uh, redo the K-mean cluster and the result actually quite different. Um, so this is the data. In the data set, we have two features here, which is uh, CPA lens, uh, CPA wise, and PITO lens, and PITO wise. So you can see clearly that there is a strong correlation to the third and the last features. So we hope, because uh, in, in, when we do spectral clustering or when you directly do k-mean clustering on the uh, raw feature space, it doesn't really handle the correlations. It doesn't really reduce the noise in the raw feature space. But when we do the tensor uh, high order spectral clustering, we do expect that will be handled. Um, so that's the data I already uh, loaded the data into uh, Databricks as a table. So you can see that we have four feature here plus the, uh, the true cluster member. So here is the, I just imported the next necessary uh, library for to do the k-mean cluster. So the k-mean method we use is in the uh, MLLib clustering. So that's the method to do the clustering. Um, because, because when you're working on a data frame that's basically RDD, it doesn't really um, observe, reserve the order. So what I did is to kind of insert uh, index to the data breaks, uh, sorry, to the table of the data to reserve the order um, for later on when I return the data frame back will be the same order. So that's the k-mean cluster uh, result. You can see um, Cetosha, which is the uh, most easily separated class. So all of them but, but are correctly classified. So that's the uh, cluster one here. And then there's a miss, for the worthy color, there's two uh, misclassified and for Viginica is also 14 being misclassified. So the error rate is really about 11.33%. Uh, so that's the return result, that's the, uh, I just inserted the, the additional column to represent the um, clustering label. Um, now I just show the clustering. Uh, unfortunately, DataBricks doesn't really supply a starter plot in 3D, so I have to use Python to do this plot. Uh, so you see this is uh, the k-mean clustering result. If you look at, this is the true clustering representation. That's the k-mean clustering result. Um, you see for this clump here, which is uh, kind of not really correctly identified by k-mean cluster um, in the raw feature space. And uh, the Cetosha actually is very, the red right pointer here is very easily been separated out, which is really different from what you see from Wikipedia result. Yeah. Um, now I just redo the clustering, but this time we use the high order spectral clustering. Um, so I just imported those, the, uh, the tensor SVD, which in the library we define, and also the spectral clustering library to perform this. Now, if you look at the result, uh, um, there's only previously is uh, uh, 
Worsi color is too being misclassified. This is the same, but if when, it, when we went to Virginica, you can see that's only four previous 13 being misclassified. So the error rate here really reduced to uh, 4% only. Similar, the return is still a data frame. Now, if I you redo the plot, you can see the this clump here, which previous is hard to separate out. Now, lots of them go to the right class. And so you can see that's the benefit from high order because you not only reduce the uh, noise in the kernel space, also reduce the noise in the feature space. So that's benefit to your uh, clustering. Yeah. So is there a quick question for Shin? I'm sure Shin is going to make links to the original papers that you can read and stuff like that. Oh, no. a, lot of, a lot of you will be as well. Unfortunately, this method is really we implement. We don't have any paper for that. No, not the method, but generally about oh, right. unfolding a text. Oh, sure. So I can use the reference for you yeah. to read. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, for clustering, you have the random labor, yes, but you can identify them by the majority membership. Yeah. So this particular package is is this open source? No, as I write it, uh, I write the whole. Uh, you mean the ten. Tensor class. Yeah, I read the whole lot. Yeah. So are you going to put it in a Spark package or something like this? Uh, I don't know. I think it's a really just a naive version, really. I mean, yeah. Evolve, right? Yeah, in the future. Yeah. You know, someone was going to pull it and blah blah blah. This yeah. Spark two point zero is drastic. Oh, this is really written on the uh, Spark one point six. So Spark. 2.0, like uh, they change a lot of the implementation, yeah. like you do data set, you have to kind of making change for that. Yeah, yeah. that's what I mean. If you, if you put it as a Spark package, it will have like its, its own and evolve. And you know, yeah. when you get old, you know, maybe something will use. Thanks yeah. a lot. Um, okay. I'm going to just set up here and log up. So it's great that Shin's been using the community edition. Is there anyone else that's using the community edition? One, you know, that's the best way to go because. Um, when the day, when the AWS credit runs out, <laughs> the shop is closed here. You know, so uh, um, okay, great, thank you. Okay, so this is, I guess, like, going to be our last talk for today. So um, I think we're going to move Matt for next week. Um, are you happy, Matt? I can go today. Well, today I don't really want to go home. Yeah, maybe. I mean, um, Harry was going to go this week, but he is not here and he's postponed. So we'll have, is, did I miss anybody else for next week? Matt, Andre, Dominique, Shakira, Harry. Okay. Okay, good. So now we'll, um, 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 Shan Shan will be doing the presentation in the research shard. So the research chart is the heavy duty one, right? So um, you can go up to 30 gigs, basically. Is it this one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, second one. This one? Yeah. Okay. So I'll um, okay. uh, I think I just gave an introduction of how EEG works and um, explain some, some, da some fit, uh, data feature of EEG. And actually, I'm still a new, new guy to EEG. And today, because um, my research is to using EEG to detect human emotion, but uh, there's not man many mature database and the publish. And so I use the database, actually it's for uh, BCI brain computer interface and uh, 
try to help uh, neurological disabled disab people and to uh, give them ability and to they can control external prosthetics and uh, with their brain activity. And um, now uh, I think here's the background of this, this uh, database. And um, uh, following is um, actually it's a, uh, it's a guide for uh, teach people how to process EEG data. And uh, I think I will just show a little bit how the data looks like and then we go back to this uh, tutorial, okay? And uh, I, I just um, uh, upload some data to uh, using the, the, the tables and the, some CSV data, we can see that. And one is um, two, yes, two of them is the, the EEG data and uh, two of them is the events data. Actually, uh, I will show them following year. And uh, we, I just changed uh, the path of the data to enter this. You can see the event to database, data breaks and EEG brain. And then full data. And uh, yeah, I first generate the, the RDD and then I generate the data frame from CSV and uh, here is to drop off the ID uh, because in the first column actually it's for the ID but it's usually so I drop off them and uh, so we can see that is the whole data looks like different channel actually is I think in this database there is 40 channels and uh, we don't use all of them and uh, actually um, I think for this research we drop a lot of them so what does this mean? So the subject three is some given subject three? Uh, uh, subject three is the participant three, and uh, series three is, I think there are four series study, and uh, each is subject. So it's a replication Ten, for each subject? Yes. And then and these columns, you're talking about channels? Channels the is the EG. So yeah. there's like a... Uh, notes, oh, yeah, put, notes. put on your scope. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, uh, yeah, this the data looks like, and uh, um, yes, is to create a database to data frame from RDD, and list the events look like. There are uh, six kinds of events, and uh, yeah, hand hands start, and the first digit touch, and actually for, uh, six kinds of. Actually, the the motivation of this research is to can detect the. The least four uh, six kinds of events accurately, and then can use this to put on the disabled people. Yeah, scope. And um, so they can what, control like a robot. They, they can control a robot arm like this. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, true. Yeah. Actually, I think I, I, I didn't do much too much data processing. We can go back to the uh, EEG pr uh, tutorial now. Yes. Yeah. Uh, anyone know Kaggle? It's a data data processing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This data actually is downloaded from this uh, Kaggle database, uh, dot com, and uh, it's is the background of it's the interview from the first place player and uh, they give a tutorial because one of them is a um, PhD in signal processing and they have a lot of background of EEG processing. So they teach you uh, something about how to. Actually for EEG data, there are usually two kinds of feature. One is domain specific feature. That means uh, when some event happened and uh, in usually in 100 or 300 uh, milliseconds, and the people will have some reaction in the brain. So this is this one is an example of the uh, ERP's event-related potential. Uh, people have different potential. Uh, this one we can see that, and uh, the this this line is the zero millisecond, and uh, it means when people see something, they have some virtual elicitation 
and uh, people will react this virtual and uh, stimulus in 100 or 150 seconds, they will have the highest potential. And uh, in the zero seconds, it's the lowest potential. And are all those channels or something? What are those little? So this is the head of uh, Actually, it's the, the, the location of the nose. Um, this two is the first one, the first in the front, oh, frontal okay. one. Yeah, yeah. So each, each squiggle corresponds to something stuck on a person's yeah, head. Yeah, yes, true. And we can see that some part is very, very high, high level of the, they have the higher reaction. And uh, we uh, oh. also different time, we can see 150 milliseconds and actually it's the highest reaction. And, uh, and this part is the, how to say it? It's the back of your head scalp. And the list, list nose actually is the most sensitive to the virtual uh, stimuli. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is one kind of feature. And uh, the, the following is the neural oscillation. And uh, this means when people have different, uh, re, um, stim when they evolve by different stimuli and uh, their um, because the EEG, they have uh, different uh, frequency, frequency and uh, different frequency, they have different power spectrum. Uh, we can see that from the frequency is from 5 to 35 hertz and the different uh, uh, range of the hertz and uh, actually they, we can see there is different kind of, uh, different range of um, a power spectrum with the yeah, y axis yeah, and uh, this one is used to the hand movement. When they when they are doing the hand movement and uh, the list the during hand movement it is uh, blue line. The red line is means after the hand movement, and uh, they try to uh, divide these two kinds of data and uh, to give you uh, a uh, accurate uh, pre predict. And uh, this um, feature is very important for EG to, to extract, actually, yeah. Uh, yes, and the following, they give a rough introduction to how to uh, process EG data. First is the raw data. Actually, what I show is the raw data. And uh, the first step is to pre-processing, is to filter the, the bank, uh, because uh, for different kind of, um, for example, movement uh, for me, and it's the emotion, and uh, actually just um, a, a range of the um, frequency is used for this, this kind of um, emotion, uh, yeah. And, um, for, for my research, for evo human emotion, and uh, just two to 40 47 hertz, we use this kind of data. So we delete the other part of data, uh, hertz data, frequency. So, so your research, this is like an introduction. Yeah, 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 true. But your research is not about. Not how, about the, how the mood. It's about uh, how the EEG signals uh, yes. are generated by certain emotions. Yes, think. yes, and try to detect it from the brain activity. Yes, we try, because uh, in our future application, uh, using the other method to detect emotion, maybe it's, it's impossible or it's hard. And, uh, and uh, this is the step, pre-processing. I think for EEG, this part is the most important and the most hard part. So uh, uh, actually, this week, and I try to try to use the MNE, uh, it's a EEG library uh, read, written by Python and uh, a lot of problems, especially when I want to uh, graph, try to do this kind of graph and the stop, and it's the same problem. Okay. And uh, uh, also EEG data, I think it's complex enough and uh, also the data is huge. So it's used um, with better use some neural network uh, algorithm, and it's also shown there, yes.
Yes, this is what I. So you could potentially, um, I think yeah. there are links when Siva gave a talk on convolutional neural nets using TensorFlow. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There are uh, there are ways to just train your own own, own TensorFlow uh, mm. convolutional neural net. Yes. That's probably something. True. True. Playing with. Mm. Yeah, we can see. So I think for for last time their their computation they just use the logistic regression and they already got the first place. Oh. Mm, yeah. But they adjust the a parameter a couple times. And uh, this is very funny and uh, following and they show how they how they how many times how, how how long they it will take for them to finish this completion and also they try to do some statistics of uh, because two players they are in different location and uh, how many emails they they have every day <laughs> yeah okay <Zero> beers. <laughs> yep all right thank you okay. very much thank you Are there any questions for Chanchen? I know she ran away, but it's okay, but you can still ask any questions. So is there, uh, I have a question, so what's the commercial application <laughs> of, of, of having a classifier for emotions, you know? Uh, yes, uh, because we are like... Uh, she actually explained it in the beginning, that's why. <laughs> no, 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 this is emotion. She explained like for people with neurological conditions when they have to move a hand, but What's the commercial application for predictive emotion from your so you can guess? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you it will enable disabled people. Well, I don't know. I would like to buy the product and see what my wife really thinks, you know. <laughs> I mean, that's what I would do. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least what her predictor thinks, my wife thinks of how she feels. All right, this is very, very good. So, by the way, um, one kind of final thing I have to point out is, um, um, I think Enons I already did, but you see there's a directory called student projects in our, in our teaching shard, right? So this is your, you know, your major part of this 60% assessment is the written part, which you've done already. I'll give you a feedback and more specific feedback, like Shin could add some more you know, sources, original sources, papers, that type of stuff. Um, so each of you have a directory named after you, and you should have uh, editing rights to dump stuff into this directory. So whatever is here is what I'm going to edit and see about some help. And so we will kind of go back and forth on this. And when that stabilizes, that will become part of the Git book. So this will be your chapter in the book, right? Um, so that's the plan. Okay. So see you for our last class next week. Make sure Dominique shows up. He was in a meeting. Oh, okay. Otherwise, he'll fail the class. <laughs> All right.